Buonasera a tutti. Good evening to everybody. My name is Corrado Paina. I'm the executive director of the Italian Chamber of Commerce of Ontario, Canada. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the first of the fourth webinars organized by EcoCanada in partnership with IRI, International Association of Italian Researchers and the Italian Network, Embassy of Italy to Canada, Consulate General of Italy in Toronto, Italian Trade Agency, Instituto Italiano di Cultura, and the Italian National Tourist Board. The past year, we realized how health and safety will always be a primary focus in our daily lives. And it is this great, great pleasure that we launched this series of scientific lectures designed to educate and understand the explanatory and predictive power of scientific knowledge, as well as recognize the contribution of science to society, starting today with COVID-19 and vaccines. Uh, for your information, a month ago, we had as a guest, uh, Ilaria Capua, the famous biologist. A week ago, in a series of lectures sponsored by RBC Royal Bank, we had an event discussing the effect of COVID on women, on women in the work environment, and in particular on mothers. This is an issue obviously that affects everybody every single day. We won't speak enough about this issue. Tonight we have great, great speaker. But before we introduce him, today's speakers, I want to take a moment to thank again the Italian Network for the continuous support on EcoCanada initiatives. We have a message today from the Consul General of Italy in Toronto, Eugenio Sgro. Please, let's watch this video. Thank you. It is with great pleasure and honor that I address you today on the occasion of the first of a series of events that will lead us to the Day of Italian Research in the World on April 15th. The celebration of Italian research worldwide is an annual event organized by Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation through its international network of embassies, consulates, and Italian cultural institutes. Today's lecture is organized by the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Toronto in collaboration with the Association of Italian Researchers in Ontario, the Embassy of Italy to Canada, the Consulate General of Italy in Toronto, the Italian Trade Agency, the Istituto Italiano di Cultura, and the Italian National Tourist Board. Beyond its rich cultural heritage, Italy is at the frontier of many medical and technological advancements from its participation in space programs to important developments in the field of medical sciences to engineering and manufacturing. Italian researchers are continuously making a mark in those research centers, universities, and institutions with which they collaborate. I am pleased and honored to be here today with all of you as we inaugurate this lecture series with the first and very relevant webinar, COVID-19 and vaccines, latest news and clarifications. As you all know by now, from the beginning of the pandemic, Italy has been one of the hardest hit countries, yet at the forefront of the most advanced medical response to the virus, having implemented new protocols and therapies developed by Italian doctors and medical personnel, so much so that their titanic effort has been recognized by the Norwegian Nobel Committee, which nominated Italian doctors and nurses for the 2021 Nobel Prize in recognition of their battle with the COVID-19 pandemic. The candidature for the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize approved by the Norwegian Nobel Committee in Oslo was put forward to recognize the fact that Italian health workers 
were the first in the Western world to be faced with a very serious health emergency in which they resorted to all possible remedies of a battlefield medicine, fighting in the trenches to save lives and often losing their own lives. The current rollout of the much anticipated vaccine has shown us a light at the end of the tunnel. It has also left communities with many anxieties and questions. Today's lecture aims at answering some of the more pressing questions, hopefully allowing us to look forward to a return to life as we knew it. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of today's talk, and in particular, the director of the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Ontario, Dr. Corrado Paina, and our guest. And last but not least, I would like to thank all of you. I would like to thank the public for participating in this important webinar that is part of the series of lectures conceived to learn more about the brilliant advancements and contributions the Italian research community has been making throughout the world in great scientific and technological fields. Thank you very much again for your attention and participation. Thank you, Consul General. Thank you very much for your encouraging and, and beautiful words. Thank you. Back to our today's webinar, please allow me to welcome our guest, Dr. Nina Niedek Schoenfeld, PhD, lecturer in discipline in the Department of Biological Sciences at Columbia University. Dr. Chiara Bertipaglia, PhD, scientific program manager at Columbia University's Zuckerman Institute. Dr. Francesco Cambuli, PhD, associate, research scientist at Memorial Sloan. And now I leave the floor to Dr. Emilia Luca, PhD, research associate at Sunnybrook Research Institute, Toronto, for a brief introduction of Iri Cerca. Thank you. Thank you, Ferrado. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Emilia Luca, resident of Iri Cerca Toronto chapter. Before presenting our association, we would like to thank ICO for starting this scientific lecture series and today's sponsors in particular the Italian Cultural Institute and the Consulate General of Italy in Toronto. iRicerca is a non-for-profit association and is the international association of Italian researchers. iRicerca is one of the largest researcher community in the world. We are more than 20,000 researchers and we have seven chapters in different countries. Our mission is to promote scientific collaboration via networking events and specific projects that we currently have in active to support researchers. We know science, we do science, and we want to communicate it clearly and effectively to general public. We are passionate about science outreach and we believe in the role of scientists in, in engaged People, public and understanding of science. Now, now I leave the floor to Dr. Bettipaglia that will introduce No Science, one of our 18 partner associations. Thank you for your attention and enjoy today's talk from Dr. Nina Knedig. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to the Italian Chamber of Commerce of Ontario, Canada, and to Iri Circa for inviting No Science to participate in this event. My name is Chiara Bertipaglia and I sit on the Board of Advisors of No Science, which is a nonprofit organization for science outreach and public engagement. Our mission is to share with everyone accurate and fact-checked scientific information in an accessible and engaging way. In fact, our vision is to build the public trust in science through open dialogue about scientific research and its impact on society. Today's event is a talk about COVID-19 vaccines, how they work and their impact on public health, followed by a question and answer session. 
you're welcome to write your questions in the Q&A box that you can find in the Zoom toolbar. We will reserve time at the end of the presentation to answer questions. Today's speaker is Dr. Nina Gnedik Schoenfeld. Nina is a microbiologist and lecturer at Columbia University. She obtained her doctorate in, viro in virology at the Institut Pasteur in Paris, studying the evolution of RNA viruses. She then went on to study drug resistance in malaria parasites at Columbia University as a postdoc researcher. Currently, she divides her time between research and teaching science to undergraduate students. Without further ado, Nina, the floor is, is yours. All right, thank you, Chiara. I hope everybody can see well. Uh, good evening, thank you for having us. We, um, I'm gonna talk about COVID-19 and vaccines. Um, but before that, just to briefly introduce my co-panelists, again, um, Chiara Bertopaglia, um, obtained her PhD in biochemistry and structural biology in Germany. From there, she went on to do a postdoc in neurobiology at Columbia University. And today she's the scientific program manager of the Zuckerman Mind and Brain Institute at Columbia. Um, and we also have Fran Francesco Cambuli with us. Um, he obtained his PhD in Cambridge in the UK in the field of molecular stem cell and stem cell biology and is currently an associate research scientist at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and has given also numerous talks for no science um, regarding vaccines and also COVID-19. And we'll be happy to take your questions. So vaccines are by far the best defense we have against viruses. They mobilize our immune system. They prevent future, future infections of viruses. And, but most importantly, vac vaccines break the chain of transmission, which is particularly crucial when we're facing a brand new virus, like we've seen for SARS-CoV-2, where we have no pre-existing immunity. And so here on the right, you can see in, in, in this graph that vaccines, um, along with other public health measures concerning sanitation and hygiene, really increased our average life expectancy significant, significantly, first of all. So from in the average age of 50, 1900s, we're an, on an average of 70 to 80 years. But what I really wanted to point out here is this blip, and you might have a guess what that could be. It occurred in 1918, and that was the influenza pandemic, which killed an estimated 50 million people worldwide. So how do vaccines work? Your body has to know thy enemy. If you know what you're looking for, you can better fight it. In general, that's what vaccines do. They show your body what, is, what to watch out for and prepare, and so it can prepare and train its immune system to generate a fast immune response once you encounter the real virus. So in the case of coronavirus, and you can see the structure here, we have those very prominent spike proteins, call them S protein, and they're sort of studying this membrane that envelopes and protects the viral genetic material. And so these proteins are extremely important for the virus. They dock onto the human receptor and make it so that the virus can enter its payload, so its RNA, and start to multiply in the host. And so it turns out that our body, our immune system, is actually pretty good at just recognizing a tiny part of the pat of the invader, invader. And we call that part antigen. It's derived from antibody generator, which is basically, as you can see here, um, or viruses or bacteria, a tiny part of the surface, often, something that the body easily sees once the pathogen enters the body. And so in the case of the coronavirus, that would be the spike protein. And this all schematics here are very, this is all very oversimplified, but just to, to say that our body has very specialized cells of the immune system that play a role in recognizing 
these like foreign antigens and sort of start to intervene. And probably one of the best known mode of actions that we talk about a lot is the generation of antibodies. And so in general, the duty, the function of an antibody is to tag pathogens for destruction. And these complexes that are sort of built that you can see here are taken up by immune cells. And so the pathogen is cleared from the body, but as an added benefit, those antibodies can also attach to the virus uh, proteins that actually dock to the human receptors. In that case, that would be the spike protein for coronavirus and could sort of prevent infection of the host completely. And so that is all good, production of antibodies, but until that happens, it can take some time for the first time around. So you can see here on that graph, on the x-axis you have the time and days, and on the y-axis you have the immune response. And after the first exposure, It'll take your body seven to 14 days to generate a good antibody response, which then wanes eventually to low but detectable levels. But then the crux is that many years later, even, your body is able to mount a very rapid and potent immune response if you have a reinfection with the same pathogen that you were vaccinated against. And that can happen within a couple of days. And this is because we have these memory immune cells that were generated that sort of linger around and when they detect the same pathogen again, they can run back to home base and say, I've seen this, what I've seen before, I need to be multiplied, we need to produce antibodies. And so you will only end up, if you're lucky with mild or in apparent infection, like a mild infection, if at all, which is basically the goal of vaccines and creating this immunological memory. So let's talk about vaccine development timelines and what are the traditional timelines that we're used to. First, we have to do all the basic lab work to figure out the best way to present this particular pathogen to the body, to see which part of the pathogen, if not the whole part, or which makes the good antigen which, um, to, for the body then to generate potent antibodies against. And so besides that, which can take years, we also need to do preclinical and toxilo toxicological studies first on animals. And only then we move into the humans and into those clinical phase trials that you've heard about. Phase one and phase two include dosage regimen and safety and um, looking whether the vaccine actually elicits an immune response. And then phase three is looking at efficacy. In other words, how good is the vaccine? Each of those will take a couple of years, maybe the last one a little longer. And obviously they're very expensive. It's a big undertaking. So each phase will be analyzed very thoroughly before moving on to the next step. Then all the data is reviewed by the FDA or whatever agency. And after that, only large scale production and distribution will start. And that all over can take 15 years or longer. It really depends on the urgency, on the funding, on the size of the outbreak we're looking at. The one of the shorter ones I have in my head is for Ebola virus. Um, the outbreak you might've heard about not too long ago. And it, takes, it took about five years, which was already fairly fast. So what made all the difference when developing the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine? Well, first of all, we had an outbreak of one of its cousins, SARS-CoV-1 in 2003 and 2004 in China. That was pr pretty scary. You probably heard about it. And um, vaccine development for these coronaviruses started right then and there. And from that on, we had a, a lot of pre-existing data also showing that the spike protein is a very potent antigen and that's all you need to kind of elicit a good 
immune response in your body. We also had some preclinical and toxicological studies um, already done. So this already shortened the timeline. And then of course, uh, there was an urgency, right? So there was an endless amount almost of money that was poured into the development of these vaccines. The clinical phases one and two were overlapped, could be overlapped, that again, look a little bit at the same thing at safety and, and dosage. And then during the phase three trial at quite a high risk by taken by the governments mostly, the production was already started. And so all this really, really uh, drastically shortened the timeline for those vaccines. And then all, again, all the data was reviewed um, by the FDA. And as you know, some of the vaccines are already um, authorized for emergency use. And so really what's the only difference, let's say, from regular, from a regular licensing process is the length of follow-up for efficacy. That we don't know yet how long this immune response that is elicited by these vaccines will actually last. Will it be a year? Will it be longer? Maybe we have to give another shot, like we do it for the flu every year. We just don't know yet. But the trials that were run were typically sized trials for any pediatric and or adult vaccine. We had between 20,000 and 40,000 people enrolled. Due to the urgency, there was a lot of volunteers who wanted to participate. Hospital sites signed up. The virus was circulating broadly. The trials were set up um, pretty efficiently and fast. The safety follow-up was done as per regulations as for any other vaccine, meaning there was a two month period follow-up after the last injection, after which we monitor sign, uh, side effects. And so historically, just for any other vaccine that we have licensed, serious side effects would appear within that six to eight week, week window post the last injection. And then either get developed further or taken off the market. So it's, it's, these can be serious and they can last longer, but they would show up in this, in this sort of short period of time. And so it's very unlikely that we have um, side effects popping up years after um, a vaccine injection. So all in all, the great amount of money, the efforts of hundreds of labs that started working on it right away when the pandemic began and already before, the pre-existing knowledge, all this made it possible so that we have a vaccine or several vaccines on the table in about a year. And you all know there are many vaccines that are in development um, and a number of them are being disseminated already. Four of them are authorized in Canada and Italy which I'm listing here on the right. It's BioNTech and Pfizer and Moderna, as well as Oxford, AstraZeneca and Johnson and & Johnson. And I'm also gonna to talk to you about Novavax because this is another interesting strategy and they're already in phase three. And so these vaccines really present some of the newest cutting edge technologies and their development was spurred by the financial resources for the governmental support and the governmental support really. And all of these vaccines are very different from what we are kind of used to doing is by making them in a rather crude way. They're giving the killed form of the virus or a weakened, we call it life attenuated form of the virus as we know it for poliovirus, measles or rubella vaccines. And we can do that we can use these amazing techniques um, because we know it's, it's the spike protein only that we kind of need um, to present to the body and to get to an effective immune response and to produce immune, illicit immune memory. And so the, the spike protein you can say is, is really the low hanging fruit here. We have we are extremely lucky that the coronavirus has such a recognizable docking protein because it has made vaccine development much, much easier. 
And imagine for other pathogens that you know, like HIV, tuberculosis, uh, malaria parasites. We've been trying and searching, doing this for decades, and we have gotten nowhere, practically. So let's talk about mRNA vaccines. What exactly is mRNA? Our bodies are mostly, mostly made of protein, and those proteins are generated from a template. That template we call mRNA. The mRNA, in turn, is generated from our genetic material. We call it DNA. So it goes canonically DNA, our mRNA protein. So the mRNA vaccines simply take the mRNA snippet that codes for the spike protein and the spike protein only and introduce it by coding it in this lipid nanoparticle into your body, um, in the, into the vaccinated cell, and then the cell makes it on its own. It's a remarkably different way of introducing an antigen to the body. You are your own creator of the antigen. And eventually, you can see here, the spike protein is produced. It sort of studs the cell membrane or is presented in little pieces or the vaccinated cell might die. And so it's floating around. And here, this is obviously um, very, very simplified and shortened just to tell you that the immune system um, is alerted and eventually immune cells also produce the antibodies that we want. And so for viral vector based vaccines, as we know from AstraZeneca or Johnson Johnson and others, the idea here is very similar in that we want to introduce a blueprint for the viral spike protein. Just here, it's in form of DNA, not RNA. And we're using a different method to introduce, uh, to do this. And this is uh, via a viral, viral vector, another virus, adenovirus, we call it, uh, because it knows how to infect our cells and how to deposit the DNA into our nucleus. And so it's engineered in a way that it, it'll transport our specific li little snippet, the um, DNA of the spike protein, and it's also made in a way that it cannot multiply itself once it has infected one cell. And then we have the exact same way how it happens. The DNA will be made to mRNA, will be made into the spike protein. The spike protein is sort of presented to the immune system as something non-self and um, antibodies eventually after a cascade of events will be generated. And I wanted to stress that in neither of those two cases where we deliver genetic material, um, the DNA or mRNA will get in contact with our DNA or mix up with our DNA. They're gonna rest, stay completely separate and they will not interact. And they're also very short lived, right? They will be degraded after they're done their job within maybe a couple of days or a few days. Lastly, I wanted to present a little bit, to talk about uh, protein-based vaccines, it's a company called Novavax, that are um, pursuing this strategy. And um, this is also interesting because here the spike protein is produced elsewhere, elsewhere in the lab. And here it's, it's sort of shown here as these rosettes because the spike protein chemically will just form these little rosettes once it's produced and then it will be administered also with um, on lipid nanoparticles to your body. And here, everything sort of happens outside of the cell. The protein is already made, so we can skip the production step and we can just jump into um, the immune response right away. We have antigen presenting cells taking up the protein and then again, a, a cascade elicits um, the immune cell and antibodies. The production of antibodies. And so we have similar methods um, of harvesting virus and making those vaccines for influenza vaccines or papilloma, the human papilloma virus vaccines that are already licensed. So just to say um, a few words on vaccine efficacy and efficacy rates, 
What do we mean by a vaccine efficacy? How much does the vaccine lower the risk of a specific outcome for any given individual? And I, here I just wanted to put the numbers a bit into perspective because we see them all the time. So these numbers here um, that came out of the clinical trials for the different vaccines sort of looked at the outcome symptomatic COVID-19. And although they're different, I wanted to stress that it's kind of a little bit um, difficult to make direct head-to-head -head comparisons here because if you wanted to do that, you would really have to run the same trial in the same parts of the world with the same inclusion criteria at the same time. And obviously that is not what happened. Just to show you this example, we had Moderna and Pfizer um, trials run in the US mostly, and that was last August through November. In the summer, the caseload was relatively low. Johnson & Johnson ran their trial later on, uh, October through January 2021, where we had a higher caseload in the US, but mostly Johnson & Johnson ran their trials in other parts of the world, so in South Africa and Brazil. So the 66% efficacy pertains to the whole world trial overall. And here we had very high ca uh, case rates as well as, as those virus variants present, right? They popped up and they're more transmissible. They get your participants a little bit sicker faster. And so most of the cases in the South Africa um, Johnson & Johnson trial were that of the variant despite. Um, and all despite that, it's still, I have to stress significantly, significantly significantly reduces um, infections. And so again, there's different outcomes. It really depends efficacy and how to look at it um, regarding the outcome you look at. You look at so either no infection, no symptoms, or moderate symptoms, it's ideal of course. But here right now, as we are at the moment in the pandemic, the goal of the COVID-19 vaccines is first of all, to prevent severe symptoms, hospitalization and death. And so just to stress that all authorized vaccines greatly reduce the risk of getting COVID-19, which is obviously a little bit different, but all of them almost 100% prevent hospitalization and death. And therefore all of them have the potential to end this pandemic. And so the main goal really, um, and how, how are they gonna do it? By inducing protective immunity in a sign significant fraction of the population. So a concept we call herd immunity, you can see on the left, what happens when there's no herd immunity, it looks a little bit like New York City in, in March, 2020. Um, where the virus just spread all over. Nobody was immune. Many, 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 many people got sick and landed in the hospitals. Hospitals were overcrowded. Not every individual has to be or can be vaccinated, right? But we have to have a high enough number of vaccinated individuals that sort of become immune and could sort of break the train, um, chain of transmission. And we can only achieve that if we have a sufficient number of people that get va vaccinated. And here I would argue that take the vaccine you can, and even later on, you know, you can also boost with, an, with a different version, right? Like nothing um, stops you from mixing and matching. We just kind of wanna so, sort of get to this threshold to go back to our normal daily life and to be able to manage the COVID-19 cases. And so just to finish, I just wanted to stress that science and fundamental research really matters. The work of scientists on these basic research fields that really could fast track our this vaccine development. The work on SARS and MERS after the epidemics spurred the coronavirus specific virology research. 
and um, novel vaccine strategies that were researched on underway were already under investigation thanks to um, funding for fundamental research. So we really need um, funding support. And I also wanted to stress that these very novel strategies, since we're only giving uh, the spike protein, also really um, contributes to the vaccine safety since your body will not ever see the whole coronavirus and you will not contract COVID-19 after getting the vaccine. And as horrifying as COVID-19 as the crisis has been, in a way we were lucky because we had these strategies, vaccine strategies well underway. And the, we have the spike protein as is again mentioned, long, low hanging fruit. So we will all benefit from a coordinated effort sort of to, to fund research into pandemic prevention and vaccine development before the next pandemic hits, which might not be a coronavirus. And so with that, I just wanted to acknowledge here you um, see all the familiar resources, but I especially wanted to acknowledge TWIV, this week in virology podcast that is run by Professor Vincent Recaniello of Columbia University, that is a terrific resource also for non-virologists and non-scientists about any virus, COVID-19, any uh, development. It has a clinical update also every week. Um, so I just highly recommend it. Um, and also I wanted to thank Hannah Varkey from No Science for graphic assistance for this talk and for your attention. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Nina. Uh, this is a, an amazing run through of the latest information that um, we have been collecting uh, restlessly for the past uh, few weeks and months. So we have a ton of um, incredibly important questions in the Q&A and I'm going to try and do my best to select um, some of them because we have about 15 minutes uh, to hit the Q&A. I would say let's uh, take the bull by the horns and actually begin to address right away the issue of um, blood clots and vaccines. We've been seeing in the news um, some, um, some information about a potential correlation of blood clot events in patients and um, vaccination, especially the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, so I wonder if Francesco wanna, wants to take this and briefly guide us through um, the difference between how, you know, the scientific information at the base of the AstraZeneca vaccine and how the media have been reporting these events. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Chiara, for uh, giving the opportunity to address this question. Uh, indeed, we know that in Europe for uh, two days, the vaccination was interrupted. Uh, and was interrupted by the government due to rumors about the presence of um, blood clotting event among people that get vaccinated. Um, we, have, we have to consider that there's been vaccinated uh, many million of uh, adults, uh, primarily elderly people, and that blood clots event uh, occur at rare, uh, they are rare event, but they occur across the general population. Uh, there were rumors of an increased advance, and that led the government to interrupt uh, the vaccination. However, the health authorities, they review all these cases, and they found no evidence, uh, no evidence of increased frequency of these events among the people that are vaccinated. So it's true that a few rare cases of blood coating occur in Europe in that period, but there was no statistical difference between the case among vaccinated people and those that were not vaccinated. Uh, therefore, there is no um, support for uh, the correlation and the, between uh, vaccination and blood clots in people. And that was a very rapid review that occurred over a number of two days, thanks to the cooperation among countries. And therefore, uh, the vaccine uh, was uh, restarted across Europe. So from this point of view, we can be uh, very safe uh, and uh, and we should go on with vaccination uh, as fast as possible. Thank you, Francesco. So for the interest of time, let's uh, move on to other questions. We have a few folks who have been asking about vaccine efficacy. What does that number mean? 
Uh, and I guess I can take on that question. Um, so the, for instance, someone is asking if the efficacy rate is 95%, what does it mean that there is a 95% reduced impact of the viral infection? Um, well, no. So if a vaccine is effective 95%, it means that an individual who has been vaccinated with that vaccine as 95%, is 95% less likely to contract, uh, to develop the, the symptoms of the disease COVID-19. And so I will say, um, briefly how this number is calculated because someone is asking also if these numbers come from clinical trials or just lab work. Um, so these numbers absolutely come from the clinical trials. The clinical trials are conducted in this way. Uh, there is a pool of people, a number of people. These people are split is exactly in half. Half the people get the, pl the placebo, half the people get the vaccine. Then they are sent out in the world to live their lives and the, the doctors monitor which individuals develop COVID-19 symptoms and which do not. So it's important to notice that these individuals are not tested by um, PCR or by you know, the, the usual COVID-19 tests. These individuals are only monitored for developing or not developing COVID-19 symptoms. And for instance, if at the end of the clinical trials, uh, you have 106 people, and they are split equally. 50 of these 106 people, of, of these 106 people uh, were given the placebo and 50 were given the vaccine. It means that this vaccine doesn't work at all because the vaccine just didn't have any effect. And you have the equal probability of vaccinated people to get the COVID-19 and the equal probability of placebo people to get the COVID-19. So 0% efficacy. Conversely, if all the 106 sick people were uh, those who received the placebo, then it means you have a vaccine that is 100% eff efficacious. Uh, so there is an, an efficacy of 100% because none of the people who got the vaccine got the COVID-19 symptoms. So now, of course, these are black and white numbers. Uh, in, in real life, the numbers that are, that are gotten from the clinical trial are basically calculated in, with ratios. And this is how you get the number 95% efficacy for um, uh, Pfizer, 94% efficacy for Moderna and so on. Differently than that, effectiveness is a number that is calculated in the real world once the vaccines are actually deployed and given to people. Nina mentioned that in clinical trials, uh, we have groups of people around 30,000, 40,000. But of course, when, when the, the vaccine is deployed, millions of people are going to get it. And, and so millions of other situations are going to happen in real life. And so the number that was obtained in clinical trials under very you know, studied situations is it, now probably going to change quite a, a little bit. So this is just something to be kept in mind, the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Nina, perhaps we can comment on the idea of bad vaccine, good vaccines. Is there anything like that? Or we can, you know, say something generally speaking about all the vaccine that has been approved by health authorities? I mean, all I want to say is that the ones that are approved, right? I mean, good vaccines, back, bad vaccines. Are you talking in, in case of Corona? No, just generally also influenza vaccines. No, no, absolutely about COVID-19 in the sense that uh, uh, we hear a lot about this word in the press, no kind of bad vaccine, good vaccines, but we have to say that all this vaccine has been approved by the health authorities. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, for, for a reason and okay, you, you, we have to say for the outcome, COVID-19, uh, just having symptomatic COVID-19, not the very severe disease or hospitalization or death, there might be a difference in the efficacy numbers, but again, as Chiara also mentioned, they might change in the real world. It also depended a little bit of how and when the trial was conducted, certainly. But um, I would stress that all of them are, are so good in preventing death and hospitalization that all of them are good vaccines. The ones that are approved were monitored uh, for their safety and for their efficacy, very appropriately so, as any other 
vaccine that is on the market. Thank you, Nina. I think it's very important to stress this point, although there may be kind of minor differences in the efficacy and the effectiveness, uh, all the vaccines protect from the most severe cases of COVID-19. Right, so right now that the virus is still spreading um, everywhere and we have so many cases, it's very important that we all get whatever we can in terms of vaccine. Mm -hmm. I do understand if there would be a pre personal preferences and I'm saying there is, if there is a few differences here with the efficacy rate, but the more people that are vaccinated, the better our herd immunity becomes. And later on, we can still get the vaccine that might have a little bit higher efficacy turns out in the end. That will not be prevented from that. But the first step now is to keep people out of the hospital and from dying, right? And from overcrowding the hospitals. And, and so I think right now, as we are, it's just, just very important that we all get our um, vaccinations if we can, right? This seems like a good point to comment on the emergence of new um, virus variants and the efficacy of, of vaccines. Right. I mean, I can start on that. I'm sure maybe Francesco has also something to say about it. We, again, as I mentioned for the Johnson & Johnson trials, for instance, that was already done um, with the, within the presence of a lot of these variants, right? So the number really we kind of know around 66% for the South, um, or actually 64 for the South African variant and 68 for the Brazilian variant, right? The pertaining to the outcome, symptomatic COVID-19. None of these people, um, none of the infected people actually died that were vaccinated or went to the hospital. So very important to stress that. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty good still, right? Um, in terms of Moderna and Pfizer, they have only, from my knowledge, conducted studies in the lab, um, not involving patients yet. I'm sure that's underway. They saw a little bit of a reduced capacity reduced that of these antibodies to actually capture the virus, but still considered enough to confer protect, protection. That's what we need. Um, so it looks good. All these, all these vaccines that introduced that really elicit an immune response with a lot of antibodies, a high titer, we call it of antibodies, even though the titer might be a little lower and not so efficient against the variant, might still be enough to keep you from severe illness and just put, like feel like a mild cold, which is kind of the goal right now, right? Uh, only for AstraZeneca, which sort of in intrinsically is known to elicit a little bit of less um, heavy immune response on the antibodies. Here, if the titer even decreases, we've seen that it's not very effective against the South African variant, at least. But so generally it's still looking okay. Um, so until we get to that point and we're trying, we're racing, right, the vaccination against the variants, until we get to a point, if we were, hopefully not, that a variant is completely um, immune, let's say, to the vaccines, we're still, we're still good. Absolutely. And, and the variants will emerge, you know, the, the, the virus mutate, is the, their normal biology to mutate over time. And, but um, we have right now a number of vaccines that we can use to counteract these variants. And there is already research going to try to uh, create improved version of vaccines that can specifically target some of these variants. Uh, at the same time, uh, vaccines at present are not the only tool that we can use to stop uh, the spread of the disease. It's still very important to wear a mask. And first of all, uh, because uh, the vaccines are still limited in comparison to the population, specifically if we consider the world population. So it's still important to wear a mask um, until we reach level of vaccination that we can consider herd immunity. And the second point is that um, although the vaccinated people are protected by the uh, severe consequence of the disease, they still may have the possibility to, to shred a small amount of the viruses in the heart. And therefore, at this time, in which not all of us is vaccinated, it's still important to avoid that. Uh, if we do all uh, this, uh, that in the bigger number, and if we consider this at the population level, it would be a big change. 
Can I also mention just generally, I think, so two things. Um, generally, I think it, even though, and you said that, you know, only part of the population has been able to get a vaccine. So just out of, you know, for, for the other people, we should maybe try and also wear the masks still, right? To not have this divide, like I have it, you don't. And again, um, as you say, it would be good and as long as the virus is circulating so much and it's within the population to definitely keep wearing the mask when we're like out and in public spaces. Whereas the CDC had said, you know, if you meet with a group of friends and they all have had their vaccines, it's fine to take your mask off. The virus uh, replicates once it's in the host and that's when it has a chance to mutate. So even if we are vaccinated, we can still be hosts uh, that allow the virus to replicate and mutate. So it is important to keep on wearing masks and, and keep ourselves, even if vaccinated, as far away as possible from any danger of, um, of being infected, even asymptomatic infections. They still allow the virus to replicate and mutate. Uh, we have only a couple of minutes left, Francesco. Sorry, I think we, I, I would like to end with a really strong point that I know Nina already made, but I think we can make it a little a bit even stronger. Uh, people are asking in the Q&A, what is the mechanism that uh, prevents the viral DNA in vaccines like Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca to interact with the DNA of the host cell? Yes. Um... In some of these vaccines, we have nucleic acid in the form of RNA or DNA, um, but there is no possibility for this uh, nucleic acid, either RNA or DNA present in vaccines, to uh, interact with our uh, DNA, uh, with our genome. Um, the reason being that uh, uh, the nucleic acid that are in included in the vaccines, uh, they don't have the maximase, they don't have the protein, they don't have the enzymes uh, to kind of uh, do the copy and paste and the merge necessary with our genome. So um, the, the nucleic acid DNA of RNA that are introduced with the vaccines, uh, they rapidly disappear from our body after a few days, no longer than a few weeks. And uh, there is no, um, there is no possibility that the uh, nucleic acid concept will remain in our body. And also the mRNA component from the mRNA vaccines, it will never go into the nucleus where our actual DNA is stored in chromosomes, right? Yes, so this is one of the main mechanisms that they are physically separated. Right. Uh, this is right. specifically true for the RNA that is right. literally physically separated. Uh, for the DNA, um, the fact is that the DNA in the vaccine has a circular form and unless specialized uh, enzymes are present, uh, there is no possibility for the two to join together. Thank you both. I think we are unfortunately already at time, so we're going to give the word back to Corrado Paina. And we, the three of us can try and type answers as much as we can in the Q&A for the questions that we haven't hit. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bertipaglia. I have a question before we leave, a question to all of you. 2003, and this is a question from normal people, you know, people that speak the language of normality, allow me. In 2003, we experienced SARS. People that live in Toronto know, remember very well. It wasn't, it didn't have the magnitude, perhaps in Toronto, but for what I read and told, and been told, it was pretty big in China. What, what I wonder, uh, we found out in 2020, that Canada, as many other countries, were not very much equipped to face a pandemic. Uh, what did we learn today, really, in the society that talks about normality, a return to normality? What does it mean exactly? Can you, all of you, say in few words, what is, a, I understand, an incredible philosophical concept, but what did we learn, really? I'll kick it off, invest on science, do not defund like the US did an entire department office that was entirely dedicated in preventing outbreaks uh, of pandemics. Just one of many takeaways. True, true. Um, trust in fundamental science. Uh, I totally agree. Um, 
what means going back to normal normality. I mean, cherish what we had and try, try to go back to that by being true to the public. And, you know, we had a lot of things in the beginning. Don't wear a mask, Ma mask is not right, for instance, and it was sort of misinformation, but we really need to build trust in science uh, back into the public and say, okay, these are the data, this is how it's looking. Um, and it's good, it's, it's good, it's true. It's true what we're saying. Yes, and we are one word, and we are also one word uh, specifically for infectious disease. Uh, there are flights every day, uh, there have been flights every day uh, from Toronto to Beijing, to Beijing to New York, to New York to Toronto. If people moving one night from one part of the country to another one, from one part of the world to another one, uh, the virus can do the same. So if there is a disease in China, is a problem for China, as a problem for Canada and United States. So these things should be addressed together by joint forces and bring nations together to develop that fundamental science that Nina and Chiara were talking about. So I, I have a follow-up question. I infer that we have to be prepared to more pandemics. Are we going from a global economy to a global epidemic? We have always been, uh, in, in, to some extent, both a global economy and a global epidemic. Uh, Nina mentioned that influenza outbreak of one, 100 years ago, in 1919, there was a global epidemic that wiped away a large fraction of the world population. If anything, things are getting faster. And, and perhaps Nina can comment, because Nina does this work every day, on how can scientists and communities supporting scientists help to predict, to prevent, to build those foundations that are necessary to uh, anticipate, if you want, the next epidemic. To the extent it's possible. Okay. Right. Yes, please. I mean, yeah, we just, um, we have to invest into this kind of research and look at what viruses are out there. We can do that. We have the technology, right? We look at flu viruses, we look at other coronaviruses, we look at the potential ones that can come up. So we should um, keep on funding that research. And, and absolutely, this will be possible also only if there is a kind of uh, more broad understanding of this issue. And therefore we are very grateful to have this opportunity to discuss uh, our science, to discuss about the vaccine, because it's only uh, when the people, when the communities in our countries are aware of this issue that we can mobilize the resources to, to address the problem. Hello. All right. So Dr. Uh, Nedik Schoenfeld and all of you, Dr. Vertipaglia, Dr. Kamvuli, uh, I, I don't know what to say. It's a thank you. Incredible words, a, a fantastic presentation. It leaves some bitterness, as you can imagine. Uh, we go home knowing we were not out of the tunnel, uh, but we have an incredible trust and confidence really in science. We think, you know, that today's society really has to rely on science. More than investment is really a trust toward science and toward innovation. And that's really what we try to do here at the Chamber. So I thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. I want to thank, allow me, all the people that have been involved in the organization of this event. Naturally, you know, my office and the people like Ilaria, um, Mary, uh, Monica and, and uh, Astrid, uh, Tiziana, Marisa, Richard, um, and all the other people. And I want to thank the Italian network, the embassy of Italy in Canada, the Italian consulate, general consulate, the Italian cultural institute, the Italian trade commission, and any, the Italian government tourist board. I really thank you again. The next appointment will be in June artificial intelligence and application in neuroscience. And here I take a chance to really thank Emilia Luca from IRI. Thank you, thank you, Emilia. Thank you very much. And please wear the mask. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.